Okay, welcome back. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. More specifically, this is community matters because community does matter. And one of the pillars of our community is the Humane Society. And we have here the CEO and president of the Humane Society, Anna Neubauer. Welcome to the show, Anna. It's so nice to see you and meet you. Hi, thank you so much, Jay. It's really nice to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. You know, you've been um, on the job uh, from what, Denver, um, six or seven or eight months now. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and you, and you were a, a veterinary specialist, a, a technician uh, in Denver, is that right? So I, came, I uh, left Denver as a director of operation or vice president of operations at the Dumb Friends League. I, do, I am a certified veterinary technician, so I have a strong veterinary background. Yeah, I, I was telling you before the show, there's two kinds of people in the world. One one is the kind that like animals, and the other and then there's the others. We don't we, we don't talk to them. <laughs> so so you're obviously you know in the category of people that like animals, and I must say everybody I know that has animals is in that category. It's wonderful. And so you came here and um, joined an organization which had a certain amount of tumultuousness going on. Yes. Um, and I suppose it, you know just meeting you, I suppose it didn't take you too long to settle that down. Am I right? No, there's a lot that the organization went through last year, as I'm sure everyone is aware, um, and a, a lot of things needed to happen, right? So first and foremost, we needed to look at our, our structure and our framework and kind of get all of the pieces in place um, to help us move forward. Um, and there, there's quite the, quite the list of things to do, um, but we have a full leadership team now, um, and so we're, we're moving forward in a really nice way. You're very important to the community. I mean, to all the people in the community who not only have animals, but love animals and, and need animals for their daily life. You know, as the city gets more complex, maybe more crowded, it becomes more important. It was always important in Hawaii, I would say. Hawaii is essentially a, a agricultural mindset. Hawaii is a, a place of aloha where people need to have ohana and part of the ohana is the animals. So you're very important. Anyway, I wanted to ask you, you know, how it was going in the time of COVID, because you're, you're here long enough to settle things down and then bang, we, we get COVID. When, you know, just when, just when you thought it was safe to go outside, COVID. So tell us about how it came upon you and the Humane Society back, what, January, February, March, whenever. Yeah, so middle of March, um, you know, we had been watching the, the situation unfold really closely, um, listening to national guidelines, what's happening across the country with animal welfare, and then paying close attention, obviously, to our local community, what, um, what's coming out um, at the state level as well as the city and county level. And the middle of March came, um, as everyone's aware, and it changed everybody's world here. Um, so we responded appropriately. We essentially completely altered how we operate on campus. We had those that could work from home, work from home. Uh, the rest of our team was able to continue to work on campus to care for the animals, um, but we switched to being appointment-based only, keeping socially distant from each other. We switched to a team schedule. Um, we made a huge call out to the community to help support animals during this time. And oh my gosh, everybody stepped up so generously. And we, our emergency fostering program was hugely successful during this time and really helped us move forward and, and make sure the animals had everything they need. Well, let me unpack some of that. Uh, <laughs> so how, how, it's really critical that you have somebody to feed the animals. Without that, you're, oh my God, that's an awful thought. Um, so, but it doesn't take that many people. Uh, yeah. On the other hand, you've got to get the food. Um, so how, how did that change? Uh, I guess the, the, the staff mostly that you're talking about, the one who um, is now on a kind of rotation or appointment basis, um, they were dealing with the public, am I right? Or the administration of the organization. But the animals, yeah. the animals required the same before and after, right? Correct. So the animals, we still had animals coming in, we still had animals in our care, and they all required daily and sometimes hourly care from our teams. And so we had our animal care team that takes care of the feeding and cleaning of the animals, the daily enrichment for the animals, and then our, our veterinary team and our behavior team that um, supports the other components to, to animal welfare. And we and those teams stayed, stayed busy during this time because, again, we see animals coming in in a variety of conditions. 
and they needed the care. So our, our medical team switched their schedules, but maintained a presence here every single day of the week in order to care for the animals. Yeah, I think one thing I, I'd like to emphasize in our discussion is that people see the Humane Society as a place where you drop off your animal when you can't take care of them anymore, um, or that you select another animal to bring home with you. But they don't realize a lot of animals are not, not well and require medical care. And you have to have a sophisticated medical uh, system there. Um, and so you got to have veterinarians. you got to have veterinarians there to handle them. Uh, yeah. To, to do your job. How, how does that interact with the veterinarians out in the community? Because they do essentially the same thing, except what? What's the difference between the Humane Society, a veterinary in the Humane Society taking care of animals and one in the community as a private practitioner in veterinary medicine? Yeah, that's a great question, Jay. So typically the veterinarians that are working in shelters are, are practicing shelter medicine. Um, and so a lot of that is based on volume, right? We're seeing typically many more patients um, per veterinarian per day here in this environment than you would in private practice. Um, some of our approaches um, are a little bit different than private practice because you have an owner dedicated to an animal, um, able to do different things, making decisions for that animal, whereas we're needing to figure out, we don't have that owner to tell us what's going on. We have to determine what's going on based solely on the examination and the diagnostic tests we're able to do. And so sometimes the, the puzzle becomes a little more complex for our team here. That's the thing about animals. They just don't speak up. I know. <laughs> so much more convenient. <laughs> Yeah, so it's actually, um, you don't have the benefit of an owner who has observed the animal uh, right. and who can tell you what is bothering the animal, or at least his observation or her observation. In exactly. this case, you have to figure it out. It's, a, it's more difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we do quite a bit of surgeries here as well. So typically um, our veterinarians are doing about 30 surgeries every day here, whereas in private practice, it's more along the lines of, typically of about five or six. Um, so it does look very different from that regard as well. I think veterinarians that, that are also practicing out there in the community has come in part-time. Is that what it is? Or do you have a permanent veterinary staff? We do have a permanent veterinary staff, but we also work with um, local veterinarians that come in and help support our needs um, through relief work. Um, we also have volunteer veterinarians. And then for any specialized work that we need done for any patients, we actively work with some of the specialty clinics to help support that. So let's, let me take a look at the community through the lens. I suppose you can do this all the time, whether you COVID or not. You can sort of take, take the temperature of the community through the lens of the Humane Society. You can see how things are doing out there by what comes in, what goes out, and you know, your interaction with the community, people in the community. So for example, you know, the ebb and flow of it, you have people bringing pets in. Have, have, have that, has that changed since, since March? Has it changed since people got locked down in their houses and apartments? It has changed. So some of our structural changes that we made during this time was to support the stay-at-home orders. And so we were, you know, operating by appointment for emergency needs only at a certain point. Um, to, again, to help people stay, stay at home, um, providing resources. And if the, that animal um, needed any kind of emergent help, or if that person wasn't able to keep that animal, we would of course take the animal and support the needs of that animal. Uh, but really trying to support the stay at home orders, um, we made the changes we made to be by appointment only. Um, mm -hmm. It was essentially a, a drive a drive through service where people would park their cars, give us a call, let them know that they're here for their appointment or they're here to walk in. Um, and then we would support that through socially distant measures. Were you treated as an essential service? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, and you know, the other thing is, and I don't think it happened all that much in Hawaii, but uh, the, again, through the lens of the Humane Society, um, the community had more than uh, its earlier share of domestic violence. People get cooped up, they climb the walls, Mm -hmm. uh, hope that's not happening anymore, but, but there was some news that it was happening here. And more news that it was happening on the mainland with pretty serious violence. Um, and I wonder if that kind of experience, that kind of phenomenon affects the animals too, because they live in the same house, sometimes in the same room. Yeah. Um, 
what, what's your view of that through the lens of the Humane Society? It, it certainly does. Um, from my understanding, we haven't received any specific requests to support victims of domestic violence and their animals. We do offer those services when they're needed from time to time through our foster care program, but we, we didn't see any specific requests, at least yet, um, to support that right now. Mm. Okay, well, good. I'm happy to hear that. Yes. I, I, I always uh, worry that pets, pets, um, pets will always love you. Yes. <laughs> and sometimes they're, they're, they, yeah, go ahead. All right. Victims oftentimes will, as just as with their children, will will hesitate to leave a situation because of the animals as well. And so if they, if they know they have a safe place for their animals or their children, um, that allows that separation to occur, which is, mm. is nice. Yeah. Well, um, then then is the issue of, um, um, of, of adopting pets. Mm -hmm. And in the ordinary times, uh, people come and I, I mean, I've been there. Everybody yeah. I know has been there, you know, walking down that row of, of, of dogs who only want to be adopted as their biggest, uh, and cats, who, yeah. who only want to be adopted, their biggest uh, desire in life. Um, and, I, and they really need, they need to connect with someone. You can okay. see it. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, uh, have you been able to do that? Um, I guess by appointment only, but yeah. how has it changed in terms of the experience of the animals and the people who adopt them? Yeah, so with, with the appointments only and wanting to keep numbers down on campus, um, so we're not having a large crowds gathering, um, we have done essentially more of a concierge service where people call in, we talk to them about what they're interested in. They may have seen an animal online on our website um, that, they, that they like and would like to see or would like to adopt. We talk them through their history as much as we know it um, and then provide information to them to help them make a decision on if that's an animal they'd be interested in adopting. And if so, um, then we schedule their pickup appointment. Um, and once they're here, they give us a call. We come out to the car, help them fill out, finish the finalize the paperwork and bring them their animal. Wow, that's like that's like picking up a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, better. <laughs> Cur curbside service. Yes, curbside service. Yes. <laughs> So hopefully better. Uh, so your website, can we can we drill down on your website? Uh, we don't have a picture of it, but uh, what, what is it like and um, how do you handle the, the presentation of the animals who are available for adoption? Yeah, so we have, um, we've always had an adoptions page which lists the animals that are available for adoption with their picture, a couple photos and some information. Um, we had to create a secondary page for the animals that were available in foster homes um, to list their information as well as uh, their, just more about them and their pictures and if there's any videos and things like that. So our foster parents got really engaged in that process and shot some fantastic photos um, of their fo little foster buddies during this time. And so that's been really helpful. <laughs> You know, I, I'd like to just stop for a moment and ask you about foster homes. Yeah. Um, I, I knew there were foster homes for children, but I did not know there were foster homes for pets. Can you talk about this program, how it works? Absolutely. So animal shelters across the country, just like ours, rely on foster homes for many reasons, even in, in normal times. Um, so there's animals that come into the shelter that will benefit from a foster home for a variety of reasons. So perhaps they're underage and just need a couple of weeks to mature until they're old enough to be spayed or neutered and find their new home. Other times they may have gone through an orthopedic surgery here and need a couple of weeks to recover in a foster home. Um, perhaps we need a little bit more information about them. Um, so we would send them to a foster home to sort of monitor, you know, their eating habits um, or ha just their behavior in general. Uh, certainly right now we put a big request out for foster homes just to help support the numbers of animals we had in our care. Ah, right now you have more pets out there in foster homes than ordinarily. Yes. They're very interesting. Yes. And, and in, in the, um, in the, the human foster home, um, they get paid. A foster parent gets paid. Is that is that so in an animal foster home? That's not the same. Um, so our foster parents are volunteers and, and they're doing this work out of the goodness of their heart. So we, we so appreciate all that they do because it really is life-changing for these animals. Yeah, again, animal people. Huh? Yeah. 
Yeah. So I, I would imagine there's a lot of people uh, in this city uh, and probably across the state who who haven't had any money um, and who have um, you know uh, felt that they got to cut costs, they got can't pay the rent and what you know other expenses, um, and they they never got federal money to help them through that, at least not yet. And I wonder if that has affected the ebb and flow of pets who are brought to you and pets who are adopted out from you, um, or whether people are conducting themselves in the same way that they conducted themselves before. I think for the most part, you know, people are adhering to stay at home order. So some of the animals are not coming to us for that reason. Uh, and and we're really trying to create programs and, and provide services that help people and animals stay together. And so with the economic downturn that so many people have been facing, we have really stood up our pet food bank and have been working closely with several um, human service partners in the community to make sure that people are able to feed their animals and keep their families intact. And so far to date, we've distributed over 16,000 pounds of pet food. Wow. You, pretty, pretty you don't do that ordinarily, but you're doing it now, is that it? We do offer a pet food bank ordinarily, but not to the same volume that we're seeing right now. Yeah, well, that, that helps um, to ameliorate problems that might otherwise arise in a in a household with no income. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And we've had so many generous community members donate pet food for our pet food bank to help support the people and their pets, which has been oh, great. That's great, that's great. Right, and how about uh, contributions to you? I mean, you're a nonprofit, um, and um, you know you, you have to raise money from the public. Yes. Um, and of course, the public has supported you for many years. But I wonder if that income stream has been affected by COVID. It certainly has. Um, we we've seen some you know routine monthly donors need to drop off because of financial situations. Mm. Uh, we had to unfortunately postpone our largest fundraiser in April because it's a large gathering. Um, and so that impacted us as well. Um, and we are starting to see that downturn in, in some of the smaller donations that we frequently rely on every month um, not come in as, as frequently because people are, are being hard hit. Oh, gee, I'm sorry to hear that. I, I mean, every nonprofit has the risk of that. Yeah. Um, and, and I wonder, did you, did you did you cancel that fundraiser or, or just uh, postpone it? Are you going to are you going to have it sometime later? Because of the size of the the group, we did make the decision to cancel it, and so it's we have it scheduled for next year, um, with with hopes that COVID will will no longer be quite the risk that it is today. Hope so, but I'm, that's a sophisticated answer, actually, because we we really don't know, do we? Right, we where we're going to be so uh, people have to understand that we're not out of the woods on this yet mm -hmm. um so okay so uh, when i when i have dealt with the humane society one of the most notable things was that the humane society would have me in a class and i would bring my little puppy in and yeah. we would the puppies would play with each other which is really important they yeah. would socialize they would socialize with with other puppies and other people Mm -hmm. um, and this would make them into nice puppies. Yes. So, uh, and it was a great service uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, so query, are you still doing that? Can you still do that? Would you do that? How, would, how do you handle that problem? That's a great question. We, so that's, was not a service that we were providing when I started um, eight months ago. Um, and that, that is something that we are likely to look into further. Obviously right now, anything that requires a group setting, um, will have to be postponed um, for a little while longer. If there's a way we can figure out some of these things, either to do virtually or safely in person, we, we're gonna look into that for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the issues that was raised uh, last, last year, 2019, which uh, led to the tumult at uh, Humane Society was euthanasia policies. Yeah. Um, and, um, I'm, I'm, can you talk about that? How has how have those policies changed? How has COVID changed them? Yeah, so it's a it's a really good question, and I think a, a lot has changed for this organization over the last year. We have seen a ninety five percent turnover rate last since last year, so there is virtually almost all brand new people here. Um, 
there was a deep dive into all of the procedures, practices, protocols that we had to take a look and, and see where we were landing with, with national standards, best practices, and, and those sorts of things. And through all of that, um, different, different ways of operating are, are in process. Um, some things take longer than others. Um, COVID-19 has certainly slowed down a couple of things, um, but has sped up other ways of operating um, in some regards, which is, has been nice to see. So looking at the programs that we didn't have in place that we needed to, um, we, we didn't have a, a really large foster program, particularly for underage kittens. And that's something that we have developed and are in process of refining right now and, and creating a good system for that, um, for all the underage kittens that we see. What's an underage kitten? How, so, how young is an underage kitten? That is a great question. <laughs> a kitten that's not weaned from its mother, um, less than eight weeks old. An eight week old kitten can be uh, adopted to a new home. Um, they're, they're old enough, mature enough um, to not need their mothers anymore. Uh, the but if they're not yet, yeah, but if they're not yet weaned, then they're very vulnerable. Exactly. And unless they get a lot of love and attention, they're not, they're not going to have a good life, yeah. Correct. Yeah. So a, a lot of those little guys um, just naturally um, don't have good success stories, um, particularly when they're born outside. Um, mm -hmm. and obviously, the elements play a role. Sickness and disease play a role. If anything happens to the mom cat, that plays a role. Um, and so oftentimes we see these, these really young kittens coming in without mothers, um, and they take a lot of care. Uh, they need to be fed every four hours. And so to, you have to have a really strong foster program set up in order to be able to do that. Well, you know, I want to talk to you about the, um, you know, the, the relationship of the pet and the owner and the mm -hmm. community. Uh, you know, I mentioned, I think that Hawaii is very um, sort of uh, loving of pets. Yeah. I may be wrong about that. You've been in various places in the country, and I, I wonder if you have a thought about that, whether Hawaii is, um, you know, uh, just like other places, or is it different um, in, in that way? I think I have seen uh, so many animal-loving people since I've been here. I think it is, it, it mirrors so many communities across the country. Um, animals are important to all of us um, wherever we live, um, and that's, that is definitely true here. Um, the human-animal bond is a unique bond that we share with our animal companions, um, and it is definitely prevalent in this community. What about animal cruelty? I mean, Humane Society, part of its mission is to deal with that, yeah. um, and sometimes it's um, hard to deal with it, yeah. It is. We do, you know, unfortunately, we do see some pretty terrible things. Um, you know, our hope is that we can continue to, to work and strengthen laws to make it harder um, and have higher penalties when animal cruelty does exist in the world. Um, as we know, there is a significant link to human abuse from animal cruelty. If you are willing to abuse an animal, you're very likely to, willing to abuse a human um, and sometimes worse. And so there's a strong link there. And if we can strengthen some of our laws, we can help prevent I think, devastating situations for animals as well as for people. Do you get money from the legislature to assist you in missions like that? Not from the legislature, no. You're purely a nonprofit. Uh, we the, are a nonprofit. We have a contract with the city and county um, mm. for the animal care and control services. Mm, okay. Um, so I want to ask you also, uh, now that you've been weaned, <laughs> 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 and you're going through your our, our ordeal by fire yeah. <laughs> in the COVID in the COVID time. You know, it's a terrible question. Forgive me for this question. What's your What's your plan? What's your plan as a CEO? What's your plan for the organization? Yeah. Um, it's nothing is static. Everything changes, and everything right. requires a plan. So, yeah. have you thought about that? Absolutely, and, and we're actively working on those every single day. So as, as you said, nothing is static. Um, so our team and, and everyone has been incredibly flexible um, during this time, but moving forward, we're gonna need to continue to be. Um, so we're, you know, we're going into the next phase of our operations, right? And with that, you know, my caveat is always, 
we have to continue to be flexible. Orders may change at the state, the city and county level. Um, you know, we really don't know what to expect, but right now with COVID-19, our, our job is to mitigate risk for our the public, for our volunteers, for our staff and everybody that, that interacts with us on a daily basis. And so we're gonna have that in mind um, as we move forward, but larger picture for the organization, it's really about continuing to strengthen our foundation and move us forward into all of those best practices for animal welfare. Will you expand? Will you um, develop uh, new new facilities, new new locations? Yes, we are looking at the west side. Um, there's more to come there, so we'll probably have some additional announcements um, later this year, beginning of next year. Um, but there there is a need um, on our island for additional services, um, and so we're looking to expand over to the west side. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing I want to ask, which uh, actually there was an article in the paper about this not too long ago. It wasn't about COVID, but it was about uh, some other human disease. Um, it, was a, it was a bacterial disease. And uh, what the, the article reported that there was a family, uh, it was strep, strep, mm. that, that's bacterial, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Um, and the, the family kept on getting strep, and they didn't know what it was. They 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 take uh, antibiotics, and and uh, that would contain that would stop the strep. But then a few weeks later, their kids would get sick again, and it went on and on and on. But nobody thought, nobody wanted to approach the issue of whether their pets um, uh, were carrying strep. Okay. And if, finally, in the end, it was determined that although the Although it was hard to identify the strep on the pet, um, there was strep on the pet, and the and the pet was carrying the strep and infecting them, reinfecting them all the time. And and once they decided that it was not a problem because they just gave the pet antibiotics to kill the strep. Right. Um, but until they found that, you know, and this raises the whole question of whether there is a danger. I'm sure you can help me with this yeah. to pe to pet owners by virtue of strep or anything else, including COVID and other viruses from pets that you have in your house. I'm sure that every pet owner in the state has asked himself, hmm, uh, you know, is my pet at risk? Am I at risk for my pet now in the time of this mysterious virus? What do you say to them? So they're looking, looking at sort of national information and what's happening across the globe. You were trying to stay as connected as possible um, with the most up-to-date information. Um, and the CDC publishes uh, updates as well, which is a great resource for everybody to look at. Um, as of right now, um, there are no known cases of our pets giving us COVID, which is great. So we do hope that continues, um, but we're watching closely. As, as we all know, COVID is a novel virus. We don't know what to expect long-term with this. Um, so everyone's pay paying a really close attention um, to what's happening uh, and really tracking cases. There have been a couple of publicized cases of cats, felines getting, contracting COVID in some fashion. I'm sure you read um, the New York Times um, article about the, I think it was the Bronx Zoo and the tigers. Um, again, right now there is no evidence that our animals can give it to us, which is, which is good news. Um, there is, you know, potential that we could give it to them. Um, and so that's what we're, we're watching closely. So if we do get any animals um, that come to us that need temporary housing from a, a COVID-19 positive patient, we are isolating them um, as a precaution um, to make sure that we're following best practices. Ooh, well, that's very interesting. Yeah. I have this vision, pardon me the humor, but I, I have this vision of a, of a, dog wearing a mask. <laughs> if only they would leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> well, Anna, it's been great to talk to you. I really enjoyed meeting you and, and hearing about the Humane Society. I'm, I'm sure we'll meet in person one of these days because I am a dog lover. I could not live on this planet without a dog to take yeah. care of me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Jay. Aloha. See Aloha. you soon.